Black and Powerful is brought to you by the Black McDonald's Operators Association. She says the word failure is not in her vocabulary. Known in media, the highest ranks of government, and now the beauty industry. Encouraging women of color to be comfortable in their own skin as the CEO of a black owned beauty brand, a mother, a warrior, a leader who calls Chicago home. Our guest, Desiree Rogers, black and powerful. Welcome, Desiree Rogers, the co-owner and CEO of Black Opal, a cosmetics company that's been around for 25 years targeting women of color. It's a pleasure to have you for Black and Powerful. Yes, listen, I am delighted to be here, and it is the cosmetics company for women of color. <laughs> We're going to talk about all the different hats you've worn throughout your career. You, of course, own a cosmetics company right now. You are the CEO of Johnson Publishing. You're also the uh, social secretary for the Obama White House. Let's start with the cosmetics company. Okay. In your ad, it says, bring your best skin forward. And just looking at you and just watching you over the years, you've always seemed to be very comfortable in your own skin. Is that the case? And where does that come from? I am extremely comfortable. Maybe my mother would say too comfortable, which means, you know, I am who I am and accept me as I am. I'm always trying to improve, but it kind of is what it is at this point. Um, and so part of that is just my upbringing. Uh, had great parents, great grandparents. I was so lucky to have all of them around for so long. And I grew up in New Orleans. And so, you know, that's a town where we work hard, but we also play hard. And so it was a very well-rounded childhood experience. And I have one brother and lots of boy cousins. All my cousins are male on both sides. And I think that had a little bit of an impact because they allowed me to just be who I was and they're all male. And so I had no other young girl around me. So I could just be the queen among all those fellas. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> Let's talk about your childhood. Were you always so motivated? Looking at your resume, you have accomplished a lot. You know what, as a young child, I would often say, you know, they say, what do you want to, you know, do or be or whatever when you grow up? And I would say, in charge of something. <laughs> you know, I don't know what it is, but something. And my mother and father, they would just laugh at me. But I always had this vision that, you know, even though I loved my hometown, that there had to be more. I always was very curious about what else is there? What, what are other people like in other cities? So I was constantly like dreaming about New York City or you know, California and the mountains. I wanted to travel. I wanted to see other things and experience uh, other things. So that was always kind of early on this whole idea that I'm not gonna stay here for school, forget about it, parents, leaving, you know. So I always kind of had that attitude, but a great respect for my hometown. Let's talk about Black Opal. What attracted you to this company? So a couple of things. Um, when I was working at Johnson Publishing, I had a great opportunity to spend time behind makeup counters, talking to women of color, and really, you know, it's almost not, I wouldn't call it psychiatry, but you got a window inside to how they thought about beauty, how they thought about themselves, Per, wanting the perfect color match, that lipstick lipstick that they were going to go out with their fella that night, husband, boyfriend, whatever, woman friend, whatever. And it really, you could really see how this was an opportunity to really impact the lives of people. And so when I left Johnson Publishing, I said, my goodness, wouldn't it be great if I could buy an ethnic cosmetics company? And I'm a black woman. I think I know a little bit, maybe, you know, <laughs> just maybe if I were lucky enough and diligent enough, I would find that perfect brand. And so one of the things that I've done throughout my career is really worked on more mature brands, brands that have been around for a long time. And so I was in a, a, a situation where I knew that Black Opal was really revered by makeup artists, but I had trouble finding it. I was like, where is it? Where do I buy it? They're like, girl, you, as soon as it comes, you better get there because it goes fast. You know, and I'm like, that shouldn't be. And so I was able to really track down the owner and really just kind of go after him for three years and saying, what are you doing with the brand? Get, what, can't you, there must be one number that you could sell it for. Come on, come on, come on. So that's really what happened is I just continued. Every time I was in New York, I'd ask him for dinner. He and his um, business partner would come and sit with me and listen to me 
bemoan how important it was for me possibly to buy the brand, et cetera, et cetera. And one day I got to dinner and um, it was only his business partner and the waitress said, oh, we're praying for Mr. Nikos. And I thought, uh-oh. And so at that dinner, his business partner said, he didn't say anything about Mr. Nikos, but he said he wants to sell it to you. And I was just, I'm like, I have to have a double drink on that one. <laughs> so but you had no idea that I had no was idea, coming. but he, he wound up passing not too long after that. And so we do our work for him as well every day. So it seems like you're very persistent. You don't take no. I like to win. <laughs> I don't lose. <laughs> lose is not in my vocabulary. Failure is not in my vocabulary. We, my father was a coach and that's, you know, winning was very important to him. Let's talk about your time at Johnson Publishing. What was that like? Did you feel the pressure? Ebony, Jet, well-known powerhouses in the, the, the black community with a, a lot of history. Well, no one certainly can replace John Johnson. He created an amazing empire and legacy. I came in at a time where there were decisions that needed to be made around the business. And, you know, of course, uh, digital was taking over print. And so you had the big decision of what do you do with print ebony, you know, and print jet. And, you know, how do you make them come alive on digital? You also had Fashion Fair Cosmetics. And so it's really, you know, the media business they had, they had the cosmetics business, and they also had this archive of about five, five million um, pictures of African Americans that were there since, since 1942 that they owned. So three distinct businesses, you know, in my, in my mind, I think it's, it was important to, to make a choice because there's so much capital required in any of these, any of these businesses. So it was a really amazing time for me to learn a lot. I learned a lot about the media business. I learned a lot about working with creatives. And of course, I learned quite a bit about cosmetics during the time that I was there and we owned um, Ashton Fair. Let's talk about your time at the White House. How did that come about and what was that experience like? The White House, well, I mean, come on. How can you not um, join the team at the White House when the president makes that call and asks you to be supportive and to join? So I picked up, I left everything that was here in Chicago, moved to DC. It was just history making, right? It's just to be there at the beginning of his tenure, to really um, you know, see the inauguration firsthand, to be involved in the planning of that, to be involved in all, you know, all of the events over the first 14 months, to really you know, work with them you know, day in and day out, and to be a part of history and to be able to participate in American history. You know, every day you know, you're kind of running around the White House, but every time you walk down that colonnade that you always see on, on television, it kind of gives you a little bit of a jar. You're like, I'm an American. I'm here and I'm helping my country kind of a, a deal. So it was fascinating. It was a lot of work to say the least. It is um, government. It is um, very public facing. It is very intense. Um, it was one chapter. <laughs> and your goal was it to, to make it the people's house and bring Americans in. And that is something that you accomplished with planning so many different kinds of events. Yes, you're so kind. I think, you know, for me, um, it was really an extension of who the Obamas were. It's what they really, their vision for America. And my job was really to, you know, be a partner or a team player in terms of creating that vision for them around the White House. And so that's what we came up with. Andrew Jackson actually thought of that. He, he was the first one to say the people's house. He had this big party when people brought their farm animals and destroyed the lawn and did all of this stuff. So we didn't quite do that, but we really wanted people to feel comfortable and to feel um, that, you know, everyone was an American. We all should be saluted uh, regardless of what our ideals are or our ideas are. And so we had a lot of fun opening things up, opening the Easter egg roll to the largest number of people ever to participate, creating these amazing events across the whole Hispanic community, Mexican, Puerto Rican. You know, we just Latin, we had a, we had a ball really thinking about how do these events reflect the Obamas? And how, if they had the time or could, how would they really, you know, make certain their stamp was on everything? That was our jobs. Washington is known as a hard town, and I was just amazed how you carried yourself throughout the whole experience. How were you able to stand up throughout the media scrutiny, the media spotlight? I always say you cry in your bathroom at home. <laughs> and you, when you come out, then you, you have to be prepared for whatever people are gonna say and do. You have to stay true to your ideals and know that you have done your very best work. You know, and if you haven't, then make that adjustment. 
I think the one thing um, that I learned, or a couple, a couple, a couple of things I learned, but one thing that I was thinking of recently is your right doesn't have to be right for everybody. So sometimes your right is someone else's wrong. And so you can't just get yourself so caught up in, you know, I'm right, I did what I was supposed to do, I, I did all, I had all the instructions. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. It didn't work that day. I only have to get up with me every day. You know what I mean? And so I think you have to kind of, I put my, you know, the things that maybe weren't the best experience. I got a nice little trunk under my bed. I throw them in there and then I just keep going. You recently had some time with Vice President Harris when she visited Chicago. You all are friends and how did that come about? And where did you all go? And what did you <laughs> tell her about Chicago? What do you all talk about? Listen, we, we have known each other for so many years. Uh, she has been, is, has been in my home. I've done a number of fundraisers for her, you know, when she was running for president, but way before that. And so I've really found her to be an incredible person and also an incredible leader and just so warm. I mean, what you see there is what you get. And so even though she's vice president now, which is just amazing, you know, we were able to visit, um, you know, her office called and said, hey, you know, would you mind coming to see Kama? I'm like, what? Of course, <laughs> let me see, let me move everything around. And so I just said, how are you doing? How's it going? How's everything going for you? She was like, this is gonna be the first night that I move into my house. Amazing. I said, I know you wanna get out of Blair House. Blair House is a house that's near the White House, but very tight quarters and lots of historical pictures. And it's not, it's not cozy. You wouldn't, want to, you wouldn't call that your home. And so we really just talked about how she was doing, what was going on with her and her, you know, she said she's really excited. She told me about her, you know, she'd taken her both of her shots. I mean, I'll, just girl talk. Did you give her any Girl advice talk. how to survive Washington with a sense <laughs> we, of self? We've had those conversations. We've had those conversations. So that's why I was asking, how are you doing? How's it going? I want to get to something a little more personal, your battle with breast cancer. What did you learn from that experience? I think the biggest thing I learned is, Desiree, you're not con going to control every day of your life. And so, you know, at that point, I was really on all cylinders, working, 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 and you know, I had certain goals in mind and I, nothing was gonna stop me from, from that. And so that just shut down everything. So your health is extremely important. I think everybody knows that. And so when you get that call and they tell you you have cancer, I thought, yikes. You know, I turned into this warrior and all of my time was really spent, you know, fighting uh, that disease. I also learned to depend on people. So I had to depend on people helping me which is usually for me the rever reverse. And so that was hard to asking for help. And so I learned that asking for help is not a bad thing. It's actually a fabulous thing. Um, I learned that, you know, I am strong, that I am actually a warrior and that I will do what it takes to live, you know, to live is very, you know, important. And I also learned that, you know, negativity or people that really weren't or didn't want to be supportive, I had to exit those relationships. And so it really was a time where it was all me, 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 me. When someone has cancer, it's time for it to be just about them, I think. What does it mean to be a leader? So many people see you and you've always been put together. Not always. <laughs> <laughs> you appear so. What, what advice would you give to other people who look at you as a role model and someone who hasn't been held back? You've done so many different roles, different positions. What would you say to someone who looks at you and said, and says, I want to be like her? First of all, they should want to be like themselves, but their best selves. Never project that you want to be like somebody else. You might use them as like a model for some of the things. You'll pick, you can pick and choose. I like this and I don't like that. I like this, I don't like that. I think that what's important is that you just get kind of solid with yourself. And it takes time, it takes years. Don't be impatient. You know, but keep listening to yourself. You will tell yourself directionally what's gonna be good for you. Surround yourself with people that can be helpful, that people that will tell you the truth. You know, I could say, I wanna be a singer. Desiree, you're never gonna be a singer. I've heard you sing, it's not gonna work. You know, okay, let me redirect that. I mean, so people that are gonna be honest and truthful, but loving in the same, same way and maybe point out some of the things you are good at. You know, and so I think it's a constant process it's not about getting here. Some, I used to think like, I just, if I could only get here, then I'd get there. But if I could only like go two more steps, 
it's a constant steps. I mean, the, the steps don't end. And so you have to enjoy each step, enjoy that development, enjoy what's around you, learn, you know, being curious, taking yourself out of your comfort zone is really important. Sometimes we gravitate to people that just think just like us, look like us, think like us. Got to get it, break out of that. There's more, you know, this whole thing as a young child, you want to see more, then you can make your decisions. You can't make decisions, I don't believe, um, completely. You just need to see more, I call them data points. I want to see more, then I'll decide this is the career I want to have, and don't be afraid. Fear is the enemy. Fear is definitely the enemy. I mean, even them to the simplest things, you say, oh, I'm home today, I don't have much to do, I'm going to stay inside because I don't want to, what? I mean, now it's COVID, so it's a little different. But you know what I'm saying? Be curious, meet people, ask for help, um, call people. You see people that you admire, call them up, email them. You can find their email. It's call you, easy. email you too? Call me, email <laughs> me. Let me see. What, sometimes I can help. You know, lots of people, sometimes I can help, but I'm very honest if I can help. Or I'm very honest if I think, boy, that's going to be really tough. Are you sure you want to do that? You know, to the best of my ability. Or sometimes I can place them with someone else that might be helpful. What is your proudest moment, and what moment do you look back at and, and say, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I regret that. I would say my proudest moment is certainly uh, my daughter. And Victoria is a, a huge part of my life and John's life, uh, my ex-husband. And so she's just like a joy because she's so different from both of us. So she's, she's that curious, I'm that curious about what she's going to do next and what she's going to say because it's, the thinking is so, it's such a combination of the two of us, it's like remarkable. And so I'm constantly learning from her um, in many respects. And so that's, a, that's like a, a, just a pillar in my life. I think, um, I don't like the word regret, you know, because regret means you didn't want to, you didn't want to do this, and the only way you learn is to make mistakes and to have, you know, some uh, opportunities that maybe didn't work out exactly the way you wanted them to work out. And so I have, I don't know, I have hundreds of those. I would say, you know, maybe some of the jobs I've had before, I've stayed too long. You know, I could have left earlier. I wasn't learning anything. And so I broke my own rule of curiosity, my own rule of const constantly learning and constantly feeling like, you know, this is a good place for me. And so I probably stayed in one job far longer than I, than I should have, and that created a little bit of tension that I probably could have, could have avoided had I just taken that chance and said, you know what, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going to you know, leave this position. What's next for you? Well, we are in the midst of building the essential cosmetics company for women of color. And so we're gonna extend that conversation from makeup to financial independence into making certain that women of color know that they're valued, that their beauty is cherished, and that they as people are cherished. So that's our big, big goal for, um, for uh, Black Opal. And we, we think that we're in good shape. We've, we've also partnered with a number of women-owned and minority-owned companies so that we can create some wealth for those companies. Uh, as well as our employees. So Cheryl and I are hoping that we will create at least, at least 10 millionaires in this process wow. in our community. And so that really is our, our goal and that's what we think about every day is, you know, how can we bring more people in to be able to have, you know, the careers that they want and have the financial um, legacy that they want to leave their families, as you know, there's so many of us that, you know, are not doing as well as we should be doing. And so if we can just carve off a, a small piece of that and have those families do better, that's what we want to do. What does it mean to you to be black and powerful? Well, powerful is in the eye of the beholder, or, you know, that someone, you know, says you're powerful. I don't know if I'm powerful or not. I would say that whatever power I do have, I'm trying to use that in a leadership position. And you know, I've always been a black woman. I don't think I'm changing to anything else but a black woman. So I've always um, you know, thought that you know, when I think about black, I, you know, I'm black and I'm proud, I'm black and I'm powerful. Perfect, and this is going to be the hardest question for you. So I am recently got married last August. Okay. I can't be here around you. I appreciate that without giving, getting any advice about what to take back to my wife. So, Oh, Which well, product should I? Well, or we, we, we're going to talk about what she likes, and then you're going to be a really smart shopper. 
I so appreciate you're gonna, it. So you're going to say, or what you like on her, you know? Wow. I like where you're going yes, with that. Yes, yes. I appreciate your time. This was wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.